Oh, hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Nick Trom, the Executive Chairman of Advanced Cairns, and I'm joined today by Jeff Scrala, the Regional Executive from ANZ, and Alicia Bairazzo, the Managing Partner from NAB for the Far North. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Good to have you along. It's obviously a pretty uh, challenging time with COVID-19, and uh, we're putting together a few videos to, uh, to just um, answer some questions that people might have, particularly as we come up towards the end of the uh, financial year. Just interested to understand um, the work your economists are doing nationally looking at trends and impacts from COVID-19. Are they sort of in line, those findings, with what you're hearing here locally or is there a difference in our part of the world? Yeah, yeah I think we, we live in a pretty unique part of the world, particularly given our ties into tourism. So um, much like we saw post-GFC, we'll probably see a harder impact in our region um, than we'll see in the overall numbers. Um, but at this stage, it's probably still a little bit too early to have those definitive numbers, and I dare say we'll have more of an idea once we see um, uh, the deferrals and the packages come to an end um, in that sort of August, September time frame. Yeah, similar um, sentiment from your own Yeah, yeah so we've got you know, RBA talking about 10% as an unemployment rate. I think, unfortunately, we'll probably face into something that's higher here locally, exactly to Alicia's point around you know, that heavy influence of tourism um, and the impact it's had, you know, on that, on that industry actually playing out in job losses. Um, so that's um, one of the concerns that we've got. Mm. So when businesses approach you to discuss their sort of their finances, what are some of the um, core challenges that you're facing and they're facing in considering a way forward for them? I think um, initially it's around working capital and cash and how they're going to trade through. Mm. Um, so obviously the deferrals, we're a big part of trying to provide some assistance and give people that working capital as they work through this period where potentially they're either shut down or you know they're they're at least working at a much Not reduced yeah. capacity and it might be 30 might be 40 percent or it might be that they can't go to work at all mm -hmm. um, so during that time i think it's been really helpful to have that you know break from payments um, but yeah that's one of their concerns and the second concern is probably around what next and, and not having that clarity around exactly what does it go, look like going back to work and having that certainty as to what opening up looks like. I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges for businesses is that there's no playbook on this, so we don't have any time frame and all that uncertainty around, um, you know, at the moment we may have hit the pause button, but when does this start to come off? And as we get to the bottom of the health crisis, and there's probably been a less of a health crisis, certainly in our region and nationally, um, how do we then tackle that financial crisis and what time frame are we looking at before mm. businesses start to see some certainty around cash flow? And that's what's unknown at the moment, which makes any forecasting pretty tricky. Yeah, I mean, at least if they're dealing with an ugly known, in many ways, that's better than dealing with a complete unknown Correct. Uh, in terms of time frame. Certainly we're advocating to, uh, to government you know, on many fronts, um, to make sure that they do give clarity uh, and certainty and stick to the script when they put it out rather mm. than uh, changing the rules. It's obviously a volatile situation though with um, great uncertainty in terms of how the, uh, the disease um, uh, plays out or the virus plays out in terms of its, um, its future spread. Um, one of the things that's obviously happened given the crunch and the slowdown, and I imagine that a number of businesses have been caught with a lot more inventory, they didn't plan for this, they didn't know it was coming, um, no one did. So what advice have you been giving those sorts of businesses and, and more broadly around um, handling inventory? We've probably seen some really um, ingenious ways that customers, particularly those with sort of perishable goods, have yes. um, been, um, I suppose, trying to move that inventory fast. So we've seen wholesalers who normally supply into hotels and um, into hospitality businesses, they've been um, back when we saw unprecedented demand for sort of grocery items, they were selling direct to the public as opposed to um, um, only through their supply chain. Um, we've seen some really good um, examples where uh, restaurants have been um, you know, unable to trade as restaurants but providing takeaway services and coming up with different ways to sort of get that out there. I suppose from a um, non-perishable stock, we haven't really taken a position again because we don't know what our time frames are. Mm. So throughout this whole process, we've been working on that six month basis. Um, it's probably realistic to say Far North Queensland is looking at a longer time frame because um, as we get closer towards the end of our season, we're looking at another 12 months until another nine months until we start our 
I've played that one probably the tourist season again, but mm. um, for that way, I think it's really just been a, a wait and see sort of situation with most inventory as opposed to a one five six or mm. you might expect you to be playing. Yeah, I think I'd probably agree. I, I think it actually comes case by case. So in some instances, it was actually a good thing that people came in with a lot of inventory and they hadn't had to buy stock. Um, so that PPE, there would have been lots of that. Yeah, absolutely, and that actually yeah. puts them in a strong position in some respects because obviously they don't have to go and keep on forking out working capital um, in an environment where that's pretty tough. Um, but there's others, exactly the Lucia's point, where there was perishable goods um, and they had to move them quickly and sometimes they had to discount them, which had an impact. But I think it's a case by case and we just have to sit down with customers and have that conversation with them. So I'm with Jeff Scrala from ANZ Bank and Alicia Viarazzo today from NAB just discussing some of the financial implications of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, before businesses come to you for a loan or an extension of an existing, uh, existing facility, is there anything that uh, specifically they should be doing to um, strengthen their sort of forecast models in preparation for a conversation with you? Yeah, I think um, one of the really key things in mind at the moment, and we've already alluded to this, it's pretty difficult to forecast. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there isn't a, a go, to, go back to work date as, as we speak. I mean, there is some guidance now um, from state government and the federal government mm -hmm. in terms of what might happen. Um, so in that environment, it's pretty hard to provide a detailed forecast to the bank. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can expect is the people to talk to us about what they're doing to manage fixed costs and also to manage their way through this period and also their thought process around what would be the trigger to go back and what would that require for their business. So it's actually, again, quite an individual conversation because it's yeah. different for everybody. But to expect someone to come to us with a detailed forecast at this point in time is quite unreasonable, I think, mm -hmm. in the current climate when they don't have a clear way forward. Yeah. Mm. I'd say something else to, that is important to have a look at is how was your business doing before this? Yeah. So if we remove COVID from the situation and have a look at your business, how were your cash flows? Um, what what did it look like? Yeah. Um, and then engaging with accountants and um, you know other specialists within customer circles to make sure that they've got all the right people working on it together. But the first key um, to Jeff's point is really contact your banker and start that discussion because um, this comes out of that discussion with the banker and also with their data product specialist. Yeah, and obviously you've got a mutual benefit, if you like, in working closely with your customers because you want to see as many of them as possible survive and thrive, hopefully, uh, yeah. you know, long into uh, into the future. And you raise a really good point, Alicia. That unfortunately, uh, there's a significant number of small business collapses in every year, pandemic or no pandemic, or small businesses fall on hard times in every year. So uh, it is important that they do an honest self-assessment mm -hmm. uh, and take that really... Um, strategic advice from their, their um, key business advisors, don't sort of do the proverbial in the sand and hope the yeah. right come, uh, come the end of the year. The other thing we've got, of course, is something of an artificial scenario in revenue with JobKeeper and the PAYG concessions, both which at this stage run out in the um, end of September, so uh, that'll provide for, a, for an interesting time. Uh, in terms of a, you know, a loan is needed to, um, to get through things, um, is there any advice you'd give people in terms of preparing those applications? I know it's an uncertain environment. I know you can't be clear with forecasting, but is there any, any advice you'd give them at a high level at the moment? Yeah, at the moment, um, and Alicia alluded to this as well, is uh, some of our assessment is based on how they entered. So some of the assessment is based on that previous Australian history. Yeah. And the reason for that is the uncertainty about the forecast. So as we get more certainty, we'll rely more heavily on forecasting. But at the moment, we're trying to largely ignore this period and look backwards as to how successful they were as a business and what sort of strength they entered this particular crisis in to make those determinations. And again, they'll be made on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's still important that that individual business comes to us with a plan of how they're managing their current position and what the future is going to look like and what changes they're making in a new world. So we talk about post COVID-19, well, you know, maybe they need to make some changes in their business going forward that actually accommodate COVID-19 better than what they might have thought of in the past. And we've seen some businesses do some amazing things and Alicia alluded to some of the incredible, ingenious ways people have faced into this yeah. and the changes they've made to manage overhead. And some of the overheads, people have um, you know, created that saving. That saving will be there into the future when COVID-19 is forgotten and gone. Mm. Yeah, as someone said to me the other day, uh, we'll never go back to business as usual. 
it'll, it'll be business as unusual. Mm. Yes. Uh, so they will move, they will not go back to pre-COVID. Although there are some sectors, I imagine, as you you think through your own exposure, if you like, there are some sectors that are actually performing really quite well um, out of COVID agriculture, which yes. is a major sector for both of your banks. Um, I would imagine there'd be some. Um, there's a lot of difficulty at the moment. I imagine there'd be some real enthusiasm for them to look to expand and invest more. I'm, I'm guessing because they've largely been unaffected by the years. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a conversation with a customer the other day, and um, that nothing's changed for them. Yeah. Their, their lifestyle hasn't changed because they're relatively isolated. Um, their business model hasn't changed. So, you know, it, it really just goes to show there have been people who are completely impacted and. As Jeff was talking about before, those businesses that cannot open, so they've been mandated to close. They've had to stand down their staff. Their entire livelihood, um, in you know a very short period of time, is stopped. And then there's those that um, have just continued to um, go on about their everyday business. And then there's, I, I think it's important to talk about a third group where, um, you know, out of adversity comes opportunity. And they've seen this and gone, well, how can I change my business? what can I do to immediately make those changes to be unprofitable in this new world? And, and I don't think we'll ever see BAU again in, no. you know, in our career. Um, there will be changes that are made within business. And, and I see it within my own business where um, I used to get all my team in the office together and we have continued to do this via video conference and having to be creative around um, keeping my team engaged and and for us to still get the social and emotional um, benefits of work through video conference and having Friday drinks on Zoom and um, yeah. other you know funny trivia things and bits and pieces, but I think that we will see that continue to evolve throughout our working careers. We might coin a new phrase on this interview: PAU, pivoting as usual. Yeah. Uh, which seems to be the buzzword, but uh, what you're getting at there is that your own organisations, but also your customers are going to need to be more and more nimble in the future and those that have thrived in the mm. current circumstances, those that have adapted Absolutely. really quickly if they've been able to adapt, some clearly haven't. So, uh, One of the uh, provisions that the government um, brought in was uh, some safe harbour provisions for businesses in particular, um, distress if you like. Um, if a business comes to you under those, those sorts of provisions, how can this be, in fr this be framed from their perspective to make, to make sure their applications are Yes, yeah, so I suppose someone who has enacted safe harbour is likely to be looked after by the higher risk division of the bank. It mm. um, doesn't change the way that they would face into that conversation. Um, I think the bank has to get real comfort with who the directors are, are they across the provisions, and who, who's working with them as a, as a key advisor mm. would be part of that conversation around how the bank then jumps in and supports you know, the future position that they might want to take. Mm. Yeah, and, and very similar is we continue to work with them through um, our strategic business services team um, and continue to work through that on a week-by-week -week basis or month-by-month -month basis or whatever the arrangement was that we had in place prior to COVID, that would continue um, to work through with that team and with the customer's account. Mm. And one last question with our notice is that uh, the banking system in Australia is actually really robust. Uh, it's one of the things that got us through the GFC in a way that was better than uh, many other countries. Um, so I think it's right to say that as we, we're in this crisis, the, the system is robust and healthy. It's pretty focused off the back of the Royal Commission and other things as well. I think there's some, uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of moving ahead with your customers, clearly you see them as partners as much as you possibly can. And uh, I guess your ambition out of this is to see as few of them leave you and leave their business as mm -hmm. possible. Yeah, and, yeah. I, yeah. And, and I think, you know, one of the things we both of which we should probably want to capture from this interview is, you know, we feel for the customers that are out there yeah. and they're our future as well. And mm -hmm. it's really important that we get as many people through this as possible. That doesn't mean we can help every single individual customer, but we want to see Cairns and the community thrive again. And um, it's really the purpose of why we exist is to make sure we're helping people through that journey. So right now, our real focus is how do we get people to the other side of this and have the right conversations and have our people have the right conversations with them to see them through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, NAB kept lending through the GFC and, and we see this as no different. We continue to lend and continue to support our customers and, and I think that that's even more important locally because 
we're likely going to do it tougher than some other regions. So uh, being local myself, it's you know in everybody's best interest that this community not only survives but thrives and comes out the other side of this. So um, it's really important that we all continue to work together and make sure that the customer's at the heart of every conversation and everything that we do every day. Yeah, thanks very much Alicia Vi and, uh, and Jeff and it's great to have two locals who are really committed and long-term locals in senior roles in two of our major banks. So thanks again. Thanks, Jeff.